All right. Great. So um, a little bit about myself. I am a postdoc at the Yale School of the Environment. Um, I did my PhD at Cornell University in the Department of Natural Resources. And so Cornell is great. It's got lots of people in conservation and forestry, um, but also agriculture. And so it's nice to be able to go talk to those different groups and just see how they think about this, how they think so differently about the study species that I work on. Um, so I study plants, soil, earthworms, and uh, the food webs that they influence. So I grew up on an organic fruit and vegetable farm in the Ottawa Valley in Ontario, Canada. And uh, when I was in undergrad, I was really, really taken by this um, uh, field ecology class that I took in the forests um, of Quebec. And one thing that really struck me is earthworms that I had grown up really thinking about as these just fundamentally good critters um, might not always be good in every context and that there's a bit of a danger to just assuming that some species is just good for everything all of the time. And in fact, what I found through my research um, over the past, oh, you know, 12 or so years on earthworms is that the same traits that can make them so good in some contexts can make them so destructive in others. And so we'll come back to this question a few times. It's simple, it looks simple, um, but there's a lot of complexity to it. So are earthworms good? And I want you to consider three things when you're thinking about this question. So not all ecosystems are the same. So different ecosystems that you might be managing for if you are a farmer. This, this is my mom in her, in her vegetable field here. Um, versus maybe you're doing more of a silvopasture or uh, you have you have a forest that you're managing that you're looking at but not all of these ecosystems are going to need the same things plants in this uh, vegetable patch they get rototilled every year they get plowed regularly um, and that's how a lot of the uh, mixing of nutrients happens you have a lot of um, you're planting a lot of species that we have selected to be fast growing annuals so they can take advantage of nutrient pulses. And um, if the nutrients aren't quite right or the pH isn't quite right, we can certainly change that and amend it as we need to. Um, forest, forest settings on the other hand, they have much slower soil mixing and instead of um, plows or rototillers mixing that up historically, it would have been um, mainly fungi doing that. Um, the plants growing there are mainly slow growing perennials and the plants rely really closely on other players in the ecosystem like, um, you know, ants to move their seeds and mycorrhizal fungi to help them um, search for different nutrients and water and increase the surface area of their roots. Um, so instead of being able to rely on things like fertilizer amendments. Okay, second question in this is that not all plants need the same thing. So two species that you might uh, want to, if you're in a silvopasture setting, maybe you want to be, you know, selecting for things like, um, if anyone wants to put in the chat what their guess is about what this, about what these two species are, that that would be good to start with. Um, I'll just wait for the, for any answers to come in before I move on. Any guesses on what plant species these are? All right, while you're thinking, um, I'm gonna go ahead and give away the answer. <laughs> um, so this over here is poison ivy, one of the most common and increasingly most common species that we've got, um, especially in our urban habitats in New England and uh, American ginseng over here. So poison ivy grows quickly and has the flexibility to grow in a bunch of different ways. So you may have seen it climbing up the trees, growing sort of, um, along the ground or even growing in a bushy, sort of woody, bushy um, ha growth habit. And they are really good at seeking out different microhabitats. They can cover a lot of ground and find exactly what they need somewhere. Whereas the American ginseng over here, 
Uh, it's a slow, long-lived perennial, and it's really dependent on mutualists, like the mycorrhizal fungi that I mentioned. Um, it's evolved to live in the duff in the really carbon, organic matter rich uh, forest floor. And then the third question that I want you to consider is that not all earthworms are the same. So the three major types of worms that you'll see potentially in New England are the jumping worm, the European worm, and um, if you're lucky, uh, super, super rare, hard to find in more aquatic and wetland habitats and coarse woody debris. Um, there are in fact a couple of very rare native earthworms. So a quick primer on the history of earthworms in North America. Um, our best guess about why the forests in New England and north of here didn't really have native earthworms is that the last glaciation, the ice sheet in the last glaciation here in the blue, um, would have pushed back any earthworm populations that were here. So in the last 11,000 years or so, the forests in New England have established, the plants have evolved in the absence of earthworms. Um, the native species have been pretty slow to recolonize, uh, but they're not big players in the forest ecosystems. So the earthworms that you see in New England in present day are almost entirely not native, coming from uh, Europe and more recently from Asia. And so I like to call this, you've heard of global warming, this is global worming. Um, where a very small number of earthworms um, are really, really good at spreading throughout the globe. So there's some temperate species, there's some tropical species, and, um, <clears throat> and uh, but a, a small number of those are the ones that are doing the moving. So we've got displacement of native earthworms happening in some places like Australia with this beautiful earthworm diversity of these giant earthworms and these royal blue earthworms. Um, in New England, it tends to be the other two things that are happening. So displacing, so new invasions, displacing old invasions of earthworms and earthworms moving uh, into regions that were previously earthworm free. So um, earthworms, we, there are many, many species that can be a little bit tricky to identify. So we tend to group them based on where they live and what they eat. So um, we've got endogeic species. So that stands for endo in geic soil, in the soil. And they tend to be um, living in sort of the topsoil and lower. Um, they move horizontally. They tend to be quite uh, lightly pigmented or unpigmented, kind of like this guy here. And then in a similar nomenclature, epigeic, epi on geic soil, on top of the soil. These are uh, species that mainly are feeding on leaf litter. Um, they're going to be really, really darkly pigmented because they're kind of exposed to the sun and they tend to be really small. And then your classic night crawler that you might be quite familiar with, those are anisic earthworms. And they've got these deep vertical burrows that can go two meters, uh, two meters deep even. And you can sort of identify them on the surface based on these middens where they have, um, at the top of their burrows, they line it with um, the parts of the leaves that they eat that are a little bit, harder to digest. So the pedioles and mid veins and stuff like that. So that's how you can identify them there. <clears throat> so some common European or lumbricid earthworms that you might have seen, the night crawler, that's a common one uh, for gardeners and for uh, fisher, people going fishing. And then we've got the red wiggler, that's the compost worm. And although it's not native to North America, it's not a big player in the forest. It tends to stick pretty close to your compost. Um, so you don't really have to worry about these guys. And then we've got um, an, an endogeic species. Well, it's a complex of different species that look pretty similar. The gray worms that are the ones that you often see up on the sidewalk that get stranded after a rainstorm. 
There's some new players on the scene in the last couple of decades um, that perhaps you've heard about, getting a lot of a lot of concern for uh, all the way from farmers to people working in forests. There's a lot of concern in all of these different habitats about them moving in. So we've got uh, three co-invading species. They look really, really similar. So I'm just uh, sort of trying to get people around the name jumping rooms. It's very, it's very accurate, very descriptive. Um, although there are a whole bunch of more local names that people have come up with, like Jersey Wigglers and Alabama Jumpers and Georgia Jumpers and Snake Worm and Crazy Worm and Asian Worm. Um, but we're trying to coalesce around jumping rooms. So these guys are still pretty patchy in New England, um, in sort of some specific areas, but they do have the potential. Um, this, this gray, this dark gray here is the area that they could potentially spread to um, based on their thermal tolerances. Uh, <clears throat> so even if you don't have them now in whatever habitat you're managing, um, something worth paying attention to. <laughs> uh, so some, some differences between the two, jumping worms get to a really high density really quickly. So you might see in the square meter like 200 of them um, in, their, in the height of their season. They are parthenogenetic, so that means that they don't need to find a, uh, another, another worm to mate with. They can just essentially um, reproduce all by themselves. And they are annual species. So if you're seeing earthworms out now or in a month, uh, they're probably not jumping worms. The nightcrawler, on the other hand, those are the ones that make those burrows that you can see. They, they seem to be quite competitive and burrows are um, separated out by about 20 or 30 centimeters. So they don't get to a huge density on the forest floor. Um, slower maturity, they can live to three to five years and they um, are hermaphroditic. So I always get this question, so I'm just putting this slide in. Jumping worms in their native range in um, Japan and Korea. <clears throat> the habitat is really, really similar to, or the uh, climate is really similar to here. And a lot of the species on the forest floor, or at least the genera on the forest floor, are similar to what you would find here. Um, what's interesting is that the three species that we have moving into our forests, into our farms, into our gardens, um, don't occur in those habitats in their native ha in their native range. So they're exclusively in places like ditches, really disturbed habitats. And there's something that keeps them out of the forests, possibly one of the other 170 species of earthworm that they find um, within these areas. Okay, so what do earthworms do in forests and really just to soil in general? So first I want to zoom you in on a picture of a soil profile um, from a forest that you might see previous to European colonization. And so the key thing here is this thick organic horizon. So that, that happens when um, there's more leaf litter, more carbon that's coming in, leaves falling, and what's used up. And so you get these distinctive layers of the O horizon, the A horizon, the B horizon. <clears throat> um, the O horizon is super important. It insulates against temperature and moisture extremes, prevents um, water from running off quickly and from eroding the surface. And it's a great habitat for fungal hyphae. Um, and it tends to be a fairly tightly regulated uh, nutrient cycle. So that's, this is a schematic on the left of what that historical forest might have looked like. Um, you can see that that organic horizon um, has a lot of different soil critters that it, uh, that it can hold, a really complex food web of a huge diversity of herbivores and predators and um, predators that predate those predators. Uh, but what you see when earthworms move into the system is they rapidly consume the organic horizon, homogenize everything, and you lose a lot of that diversity and the biomass is replaced with really just earthworms. Okay. 
what this looks like um, sort of in, in real life um, based on that cartoon. This is your historical soil with a lot of organic matter built up here, your distinct horizons. And then this is the more homogenized um, soil that you get with European earthworms. <clears throat> And what this looks like for uh, plant available nutrients, so exchangeable nutrients over time. So over here on the left, this is like that first picture, that unvaded um, soil, is a lot of the nutrients can be sort of tied up. Um, when earthworms move in, you get a release of a lot of those nutrients. And that's where some plants are gonna be able to take advantage of that rapid mineralization of nutrients. Um, unfortunately, it's not a lot of our sort of slow perennial native plants. And over time, what you get is a lot of those nutrients, a lot of the carbon starts to be um, leached out of the system. And so you end up with sort of lower exchangeable nutrient concentrations. Um, another way of showing that is that this O horizon, the organic horizon, gets consumed by earthworms, and a lot of those nutrients get homogenized, but it isn't totally homogenous. So what you're looking at here is how um, some other nutrients of calcium, potassium, and, and some, other, some other nutrients down here, um, how they change with earthworms in a system, right? So the O horizon, the earthworms eat that up, and the nutrients end up here in the A horizon. Um, what's interesting is they're depleted from the B horizon. So that kind of stumped us when we were thinking about that. Um, so we decided to look at where the roots were growing in the profile of the soil. And you would think if you were a plant, you'd put your roots into that A horizon, tons of nutrients, especially calcium, which is really important um, and often limiting in forests. But that's not what we saw. We saw all of the roots down here in the B horizon. And so what we think is happening is that it's just so difficult to root in the A horizon if you're growing um, in the presence of earthworms in forests. So earthworms are actually eating the roots, believe it or not. They're not just mixing up soil um, and old leaves. They're actually consuming a lot of fine roots. Um, and by losing that organic horizon, those great rooting conditions, Pretty stressful for a plant to live there. Um, what we don't really know, we don't know the identity of those roots though. So is it that the existing plants can put their roots down deeper? Um, or is it that they're being replaced by deep rooted species? I do want to add that uh, we looked at the tissue of the plants. And so we found that um, in a lot of cases you get deficiency of nutrients. Um, but calcium is the exception to this. And one thing that's kind of interesting is that for plants growing in um, highly earthworm invaded systems, there's a really, really huge signal in the insect damage. So leaf herbivory and things like that. So that um, might be a consideration for those of you with things like um, orchards or other fruit crops. <clears throat> um, one of the other impacts is to the fungal community. So we see a big signal here when earthworms move in. Um, overall, it seems like earthworms moving into a system shift it from being dominated by a fungal community to being dominated by a bacterial community. And some of the reasons for that are that Earthworms, of course, love to feed on fungal hyphae. Those are the tendrils that are growing all throughout the soil. Um, they're physically disturbing them by moving through the soil and bumping into them and uh, mixing things up. And also that, um, that altered habitat of huge um, moisture and temperature fluctuations is stressful for the fungal hyphae. On the flip side, um, Earthworms can also act as vectors uh, for spores. And so what this ultimately means for plants is gonna really depend on whether you've got good fungi, bad fungi, and whether the earthworms are gonna consume the hyphae or actually act as vectors. 
um, one avenue that I'm exploring a little bit is looking at how specifically mycorrhizal fungi are impacted. So remember, those are um, those are the fungi that are um, that are interacting with plants. And in this case, we've got an arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. So that those ones grow their hyphae into the plant cell. So this is this is a root cell of a dogwood, and they form these arbuscules. So that's the um, <clears throat> that's the location where the exchange of nutrients and uh, carbon happens. And I found some evidence that earthworms negatively affect um, mycorrhizal fungi, but there is there's still a lot to know on that. So turning to jumping worms impacts on soil, um, the study of this is still fairly new. We think it's a lot of the same things that the European lumbricid worms do, um, but there's a few key additional differences. So um, erosion seems quite a bit more pronounced. You get exposed mineral soil, and this kind of all comes from the fact that you get these grump, crumbly gravel-like chunks. Um, of castings that the jumping worms create. If any of you have seen these in real life, they can be really, really thick. You can sort of stick your arm into the soil of castings and go all the way up to your elbow with very little effort. And this challenges our relationship between soil properties and ecosystem functions. So maybe you're managing your orchard um, for things like bulk density. Low bulk density is usually good, nice loose soil, um, but in this case, it goes too far to the other side. Um, and while the aggregates themselves, so these little chunks are fairly stable, the, the between aggregate cohesion is really, really bad. So it's essentially like trying to grow things in gravel. Uh, and of course, one thing that we see is that the porosity of the soil gets really high, so nutrients and water uh, run through it really quickly. And I'll just say a quick word about what this means for uh, carbon sequestration, because it could be a whole talk. Um, and we see both mineralization of carbon, so um, microbes um, releasing CO2, but also stabilization of some, some things. So what this ultimately means for carbon, uh, carbon dynamics is really, really complicated and um, we don't immediately know. So what are the impacts of earthworms? So this is both jumping worms and uh, lumbricid worms on heavy metals. They're both, both in this. So the, the jumping worms are amenthes, these squares, and then the other ones are all lumbricid earthworms. And what you see here, this one, this is the bioaccumulation factor. So anything above this line um, is going to be a bioaccumulation of these various metals. That's a little bit scary. Cadmium, mercury, um, lead, all sorts of things. All of these earthworm species are above that one level. Um, jumping worms are of particular concern just because not not that they're um, not that they have more metal in them per se than the other earthworm species, but just that their biomass is so big on the forest floor, and so it's such a huge um, arrow of metals being released from the soil. So if you are wondering if your earth, if your chickens should be eating earthworms, I would definitely suggest that you um, don't feed them a diet of mostly earthworms. Otherwise, you're going to be consuming some um, heavy metals. So this is just a little video showing you the texture of the soil that I was describing. So really crumbly, really um, kind of gravelly. And one thing to notice is just how loose it is. Um, really good for pulling weeds, but really bad for other things trying to root. <clears throat> um, so what this means for plants um, is that you're going to see really, really low germination. If you're trying to grow in gravel, super dry, very hard to germinate. 
um, root desiccation, especially things that have a lot of fine roots, and unstable rooting. Um, and what this means for plant communities in the forests is different for native species and non-native species of plants. So this is back to our ginseng, our native plant. <clears throat> Um, you see that the cover of native plants is much, much higher here in these jumping worm free plots. But when jumping worms move in, the cover of native plants is down here around 10%. Conversely, with invasive plants like garlic mustard here, the jumping worm invaded plots have really, really high cover of invasive plants. And um, native plants are quite a bit lower. Um, one quick little tidbit that I was surprised to see um, such an extreme response was when I started looking at the impacts of jumping worms and other things that are going to be stressing out plants. So white-tailed deer stressing plants out from above, um, jumping worms stressing them out from below, and I saw within two years a complete extinction of some of the native plants that I was looking at. It was really, really quite profound. And um, currently there's no management for jumping rooms. And so one of the strategies that I'm looking at that I would love to hear your experiences with is um, trying to find plants and crops that you can still grow with jumping rooms. So this is a combination of big data looking at um, different species traits and their abundance but also natural history data. So there's little things that we've found in some species that seem to confer a benefit in growing with jumping worms. Jack in the pulpit has got these deep, really chemically defended roots. Trout lily has stolons, and so it's uh, it can sort of move laterally across the landscape, kind of like a described poison ivy uh, doing and find a little microhabitat um, to grow in. We also see some of the common ferns doing pretty well, and they're also chemically defended, but we, we don't really know why they seem to withstand jumping worms. So this is still quite ongoing. <clears throat> um, this has big consequences for the rest of the food web. So you see a crash in a lot of those other um, soil faunal native soil faunal species, and this has an impact for some of the bigger, uh, bigger organisms that depend on those. Other things that you see impacts to golf courses and recreational fields, um, impacts to agricultural drainage, so this is a big one in some places, um, the fields, the castings block up the drainage, stormwater drainage and infrastructure like here on these stairs. And um, just recently, we've started to look at what, it, what the consequences are for drinking water when you have huge um, erosion events of castings moving down and into the waterways. And for those of you that love your stone fences, um, jumping worms seem to erode the soil around, around um, fences preferentially. And I'm seeing these toppling over, which makes me quite sad to see. So what does this mean for management and uh, management of your habitats? And when we're talking about jumping rooms specifically, the pre prevention of them getting in. <clears throat> so not all invasions are the same. Chestnut blight, which you might've heard of, um, showed up on the scene in North America and wiped out the chestnut essentially from the forest in um, about a decade. Then there were things that took quite a bit longer, like emerald ash borer, um, because we changed some of our habits that um, moved them around, so moving firewood and things like that. Um, jumping rooms seem to be almost entirely moved around by our, our actions. Um, so there's a lot that we can do to prevent that. <clears throat> so for those of you that have, um, that are planting larger trees and uh, shrubs and things like that, selecting bare root planting options is, is a really, really key one. Um, the earthworms and the cocoons, so their eggs, are visible with the, with the naked eye, so you can actually make sure there aren't cocoons on the roots. 
and if if you have potted plants that you think are infested with jumping worms, you can uh, strain and dispose of the wash debris. And there's a lot of other um, great reasons to plant bare root that I won't get into, but some of you probably know even better than I do. Um, checking the roots before planting. Um, so if you have, if you're planting um, some crop that you just is not going to work well with bare root plants, just pop it out of the pot. Um, you can do a soaking with a mixture of mustard water, uh, of ground mustard and water um, to see if any worms come out, but just a visual inspection is really, uh, really good to do. If you are applying compost to your orchard system, um, make sure that you are, uh, make sure that it's actually, and it's worm compost, make sure that it's got these red wigglers and not jumping worms. <clears throat> if you do have an inf infestation of jumping worms, making sure that some of those um, things that you're pruning and piling up that you're not moving into a forest. Um, and if you, I think there's some people here that maybe are involved with nurseries and garden centers. So, um, we found that customers are increasingly looking for jumping worm free plants and like a guarantee of that. And they're willing to pay a lot more, well, some amount more, not a lot more, um, for that peace of mind. It can be really, really terrible for farmers and gardeners to get these things. And it's hard to have any top-down change. So New York State, for example, has um, legislation, laws against moving jumping worms, but it's really, really hard to implement. Um, and I do, so I do think that prioritizing prevention and bottom-up solutions where your plant producer and yourself, you're talking to each other um, about how important this is, is really key. Now, if you if you don't have jumping worms yet, or even if you do, um, I want you to think a little bit about the root traits of the things that you're planting. So, um, deep-rooted plant species, deep-rooted crops, bigger individuals, so spending a little bit more money to um, buy the slightly older seedling um, is really quite useful. A, a lot of the jumping worm impacts and European worm impacts are also, they're happening pretty shallow. So if you can get your roots down here, that's a great strategy. And then the three Ps, permaculture, pollinator, prairie gardens, they do tend to have those deeper rooted um, species that can withstand jumping rooms a little bit better. Experimenting with ground covers and stoloniferous plants. Or maybe poison ivy is not one that you want to be planting, but maybe something like native partridge berry. And then documenting these crops and these um, other plants that you're growing and the changes with jumping worms. That's really important. And um, these unique adaptations, it's natural history knowledge, seems to be as useful, if not more useful, than the big data analysis. Um, for machinery, if you're moving in um, in and out of areas, just making sure that you're not moving a lot of soil that can contain earthworms between sites, especially if there's a known jumping worm invasion. Um, if you are applying mulch, topsoil, compost, make sure that these are either heat treated to 104 Fahrenheit for three days um, or you know, make your own if that's possible. So I, uh, we were having <clears throat> the electrical company had hired some people to cut down the trees on my street and I flagged him down and I said, can I have that mulch? And he was like, great, I would have to pay to get rid of it otherwise. And he dumped the whole pile of mulch that had gone directly from the trees on my street to my yard. And so um, thinking about your supply chain uh, where that stuff comes from is really important. And then learning to recognize the signs. So the jumping worms, as I mentioned, annual species, so they're going to be visible in summer, uh, but not all year round. So just a little refresher on what the soil looks like. We've got uninvaded soil, 
the absence of earthworms, and then this homogeneous looking mixed up soil with European earthworms, and this crumbly gravel-like soil with jumping worms. <clears throat> um, telling them apart is gonna be really key. Um, so the European worm here, it's uh, clotellum, so that's this band here, is closer to the middle of the worm. And the jumping worms is very close to the head. Um, and the jumping worms, it goes all the way around the body. And the European ones, it's on, it's sort of just on the back of the worm. Kind of, it's called a saddle. Looks a little bit like a horse saddle. The jumping worms um, can be darkly pigmented, metallic looking in the sun. Uh, whereas the European worms that are big like this, the night crawlers, tend to have lighter tails and darker noses and this flattened tail called the beaver tail that helps them uh, move along the ground. Identifying to species, I'm, I'm not going to stay on this. If you want this slide, this little key to tell what kind of earthworm you have, um, shoot me an email and I can definitely share it with you. Um, if you do see a jumping worm, log it into one of these platforms that we use to um, measure their spread. So all of these should be available in Massachusetts. IMAP Invasives, and that's the one that I sort of use the most, but Seek is this awesome app with a great artificial intelligence that you can literally take a picture of an earthworm and it's pretty good at actually um, telling you if it's a jumping worm or not. Pretty, pretty cool. And then um, Ed Maps, if you're tuning in from somewhere else, um, this has got pretty good coverage too. So another bit of advice is to manage the things that you can. So um, if you do have jumping worms and they are causing trouble in your um, blueberries or your raspberries, uh -uh. Um, maybe think about managing for things like white-tailed deer. So fencing, um, maybe taking a bow hunting. <laughs> um, and some of these things that you can do will be, <clears throat> uh, will just give those plants just the, the um, extra energy that they need to survive. <clears throat> Um, so, and then if you're going fishing, don't use them as bait. They're not very good as bait. And then follow, following the research. So um, there's some chemical and biocontrol options that are being evaluated, but we still don't know what the possible other impacts to other critters and those rare native earthworms are going to be. So currently there's no recommendations for chemical or biological controls for jumping worms, which is why I spent so much time talking about the prevention and the sort of, if you've got them, here's some strategies that you can still implement. So we come back to our question, are earthworms good? And what I hope you've figured out is that that's way too simple of a question. Um, you need to be thinking about the ecosystem you're managing for, the crops that you're interested in, the crops of the species that you're interested in, and then what time what type of earthworms you have so thank you to the people that have funded this research and i think i have some time for questions yes absolutely thank you you have plenty of time for questions um our next speaker isn't on until 11 15 so we'll take some questions and if there's extra time um, we can take a little break too but I am gonna, I'll, I'll fire off to you the first couple of questions that have come in. Um, so one is coming to you from a, uh, a livestock farmer who's, who's I think 100% grass fed. And I believe this is in reference to the, the really low bulk density that the jumping worms can create. And so his question is, um, can that be fixed with light animal compaction? So if you are grazing, um, maybe you have a silvopasture pasture situation going on. Oh, I've never thought about that. Um, I, it is something that golf courses kind of do is they will have rollers to try and get that compaction um, back in. So I think it could work. 
Um, however, it, there's also the erosion component. So it, you would have to consider what the slope looks like if there's water downstream. Um, but it, yeah, I, uh, I'm i gonna add that the, to the roster of things to look into. If you, the person who asked the question has any insight, feel free to unmute yourself and add add anything. Okay, in the meantime, unless Nick, if you wanna hop on, don't hesitate, but I'll, I'll give you the next question. Um, and that's gonna be for the past 40 years, we have been encouraged to build earthworm populations by adding organic matter. And now it sounds like I should be looking for a way to get rid of them. Um, so yeah, so how do we contextualize these sort of competing ideas about attracting earthworms that maybe we want and not attracting those that we don't want? Yeah. Well, the good news is that I think um, in a lot of cases, the earthworms are following the good soil as opposed to creating it. And so we, you know, we saw the earthworms do a lot. We see them in good soil or rich organic soil. And so we thought that must be the earthworms doing it. Um, but one thing that I'm finding through my research is it might not be causative, it might be correlative. And so um, with the European worms, especially with the jumping worms as well, it seems like they're following the good soil. So in that case, you don't need to make huge changes, I would say. Um, but I think as long as you're not bringing worms in, <laughs> either as the castings contaminated with cocoons, um, that you you don't need to be thinking too much about um, specifically managing the earthworms themselves. It's really hard to do. Yeah, but I, I you know, it's it's a, it's one of my favorite questions, and I, I think I think about it a lot. I've got a lot of a, I've got a lot to say on the matter. <laughs> I think a lot of it comes from the fact that, um, you know, Darwin was a big person to bring to light some of the things that earthworms do and he was working in England and um, and we do tend to sometimes export our the European ideas of what makes good soil um, and just assume that it's true everywhere <laughs> so I'll, I'll leave it at that for now yeah, that, that's a very good point going back to the, the the origin, so to speak, of of Darwin and how that was a bad evolution joke, but um, and, and how we're going kind of in, in popularity. Um, so, OK, a few other questions uh, that that have come in and some of these came in in advance of the workshop. But um, one really interesting question is, uh, will the earthworms or the jumping worms rather die off or move on once they have um, decompose a lot of your leaf litter? And if so, um, can reducing those organic matter inputs be a way to, to speed up them going somewhere else? Yeah, that is the key question. Do you, do you feed an invasion or do you starve an invasion? Um, we, so the first part of your question, do they eat themselves out of house and home? And that does not seem to be true. It seems to be that they are exceptionally good at engineering their own habitat to be able to continue to exploit resources. So they have a really flexible diet. Once they've eaten all the leaf litter, they can change to roots, they can change to microbes, they can change to you know other things, whereas a lot of other worms have a narrower uh, suite of things that they can eat. Um, they do tend to pick up a lot of parasites, which is kind of interesting. So it might not be that they're limited by food, but it might be a carrying capacity with parasites. Um, haven't seen enough examples of them crashing, the populations crashing permanently. It does seem to be a huge fluctuation from year to year. Um, but I, I, I am hopeful that that, that is true they eat themselves out of house and home or get enough parasites and we're watching for um, examples of that to try and see if we can exploit that for potentially managing them. 
Great. So um, another question, this is related to, to soil tests. Really good question here. Um, how will soil test results from dumping worms or dumping worm invaded soils rather be affected compared to pre-invasion test results? Um, and then the follow-up question to that is, um, are, are there significant differences between conventional soil tests and the new soil health tests like from Cornell? Um, so I, I will add, if, in case it helps with your context, too, Anise, that I have tested some some of the middens from fields that had uh, infestations for nitrate, and, and they were just phenomenally off the chart for those nitrate tests. And I thought, oh boy, now we're managing a completely different issue in even like our row crops and our corn. Mm -hmm. Now, it, was that an invasion? That was the jumping worms that you're talking mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I might have to sit with that question for a little while. I guess the key thing is that those um, those tests are a snapshot of what's going on in the nutrient cycling. And so, yeah, you're seeing this huge pulse in nitrate. Um, but what is that going to look like in 10 years, um, at the end of the season? So, um, yeah, thinking about it over time instead of a snapshot might be important. Um, I think bulk density as a predictor of soil quality is not going to be appropriate in, in these settings, unfortunately. Um, Oh, is that, that's, yeah, does anyone else have any ideas on that? That's a really, really good question. Yeah, it's, it's I think, um, you know, because of course there is a lot of interest in, in the soil health tests, especially mm -hmm. in addition to our traditional tests. I think there's going to be a new mindset of that context, I guess, of interpretation, sure. Yeah, I, I work really closely with people that are sort of more traditional carbon soil scientists in agricultural and turf grass settings. And they're completely, completely on board that this is like an entire reimagining of what soil um, function and what soil nutrient cycling looks like. And so, yeah, I, I don't have it's a really it's a it's a really good question i don't have the answer off the top of my head but i really do think that potentially rethinking some of those um some of those signifiers would be important i do still think organic matter is probably one you can be pretty uh pretty sure of as being still related to plant health and things like that i'm gonna i'm gonna keep on with that question <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and the soil organic matter, I think that's a great, a great orient, a place to orient to. Mm -hmm. um, another question that came in is, um, you indicated a relationship of uh, worm populations and some species with heavy accumulation, but I missed the take home uh, or the takeaway message from that. Could you repeat that? Yeah, yeah, it was a little complicated, and it, it, um, I've heard it sort of passed around in circles, and I think people often misunderstand it. So the take home message is that. Um, all earth is that most earthworms are um, bioaccumulators of heavy metals. The reason we're more concerned about jumping worms than other earthworms is that their biomass is so big. So it becomes this huge pathway out of the soil into the food web. Whereas on a per mass basis, a nightcrawler and a jumping worm are both super high in toxic metals, um, but it's just that there are more jumping worms. And um, I did, I cut this out of the presentation because we, we had too much other stuff to talk about, but um, because jumping worms are, and earthworms in general, are displacing the rest of the soil community, so the millipedes and the springtails and stuff like that, um, there's only one thing for a lot of the other organisms to eat, and that's jumping worms. So instead of having a big buffet of very nutritious things, they've got this one one meal that they can eat that's high in toxic metals that's not very nutritious doesn't have the fat and the protein that uh, birds and salamanders need and they go through these boom and bust cycles so they appear in huge abundances and then they disappear um, which is not great for things like birds that need to eat fairly often great so take message 
don't let your don't encourage your chickens to eat a diet of entirely earthworms. <laughs> that that is prudent advice and definitely something I would not have thought of on my own. Yeah. Um, and actually the person that discovered that is at UMass, um, Justin Richardson, who's a professor in at UMass, Amherst. Oh, great. <laughs> UMass shout out. We love that. <laughs> um, here, here's a question from a, an orchardist, um, which is, what should I be doing as an orchardist? Organic matter is good, not good. I should stop making compost and spreading wood chip mulch. Should I find a reason to spray copper more often? <laughs> um, okay, let's go through that bit by bit. <laughs> so the first one was kind of, or one of them was kind of already asked, do you feed the it depends if you already have jumping worms or not. So if you do have jumping worms, do you feed it? Do you starve it? Um, anecdotally, feeding it does seem to be a little bit of what people are reporting is beneficial. But on the other hand, there's the psychological thing of will people really be able to evaluate um, objectively whether what they're like, if they do nothing, um, are they ever going to say that that's just as good as doing something? Okay, so <clears throat> that's if you have them, feed it or starve it. If you don't have jumping worms, um, paying really close attention to the things that come onto your property and especially into your orchard. So get that mulch from the tree to your property. Um, get that compost heat treated. Um, solarize it maybe in like a black plastic bag that can get up to really high temperatures. Um, check the roots of any new plant stock that you're bringing in. Choose bigger plants if you do think a jumping, a jumping worm invasion is very possible. Um, the copper thing, um, the, the beauty of this is that actually a lot of golf courses were managing for earthworms back in the 60s and 70s when you could put whatever you wanted onto the soil and, uh, you know, scorched earth, mercuric sulfide and copper sulfate. And uh, it worked really well, but not for very long. So they came back in abundance after about seven years. And at that point, the metals were in the water getting into your chickens because of all those worms so i don't uh so i think that the, the two most promising things that are coming up are the saponin treatment so that is a tea seed meal um so it's like if you've ever cooked quinoa that's the bubbly stuff that comes that comes up into your pot um and it it is really effective at killing jumping worms and their eggs um, but even though it is from a plant, it still has potential impacts to other species. So um, Wisconsin folks at the Wisconsin Botanical Gardens are working on that. And hopefully they'll have some good advice for us um, with that. Great. I think I hit all the topics. Yes, you did. <laughs> I'll feed you um, one more question if you're up for it. Sure. And then yeah. and I think it'll dovetail us um, into our next speaker. So I'm gonna combine two. Um, one question is, um, so when we do a soil health assessment in field and mm -hmm. we're looking for earthworms, should we rewrite our assessment so that question one is what species are here? Um, and then two, is there anything good that we can say about the presence of jumping worms? Um, okay, yeah, what species are here? Maybe not even what species, but those three big groups that I mentioned at the beginning, the epigeic, the endogeic, and the anisic, um, and jumping worms, maybe as a fourth, they're kind of endoepigeic, but they're in their own category. And that is actually going to give you a lot more information about soil health and earthworms. That is a fantastic idea. Um, the uh, It's going to tell you about where the organic matter in your soil is, um, what the mixing is like, whether it's shallow mixing, whether it's deep mixing. Um, they're feeding on different things. So the uh, the endogeic ones can persist even when there's very little organic matter left in the soil because they um, can feed on microbes. Whereas the epigeic ones, they're going to be needing a lot of like, higher organic matter. So I think that's 
fab idea to at least get, and it's pretty easy to ID. Is it the small dark ones on top? Is it the light gray ones down in the soil? Or is it the, the night crawlers? Or is it the jumping worms? Okay, is there anything good to say about jumping worms? Um, in New England, no. <laughs> uh, in Brazil, where they, in parts of Brazil where they have, and maybe this, it, I'm sure this exists somewhere in New England too, where they have really thick clay soils that are really, really dense. Um, jumping worms can't get to the abundance that they can get here, there, and they do increase uh, in, in that case, they're dealing with, you know, compact clayey soil, very little water, water infiltration. So some of those actions of jumping worms can actually be super beneficial. And this is why I go back to those three questions. What's your habitat like? What's your, what species are you managing for? What crops are you managing for? And what worms do you have? Wonderful. Thank you so much. Maybe maybe our friends in Vermont um, can can get lucky with their clay soils. <laughs> um, okay, uh, let's see. Okay, I think now we're going to go ahead and switch over to, to Jody, who is going to talk to us more about earthworms. Thank you so much, Nisa. This was wonderful. And um, may maybe we'll send you an email about rewriting our soil health assessments to start with that earthworm question. It seems like that's yeah. where we need to head. I'm going to be percolating that question in my head all day. Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. Um, if anybody didn't get your question answered, yeah, please share them with me and we'll get you in touch.